you know that you live in a story? I want you to think about it just for a minute. There's a story about the journey we call life. We're just a part of a bigger story. When we think about it, our lives are stories within a great big story. The bigger story started when the creator of this universe decided he wanted to create man so that he, man, could have a relationship with the creator. That's the bigger story. You see, in that story, that story entails several different things. Eugene Peterson, in his book called Working the Angles, says there's five elements in a story. Now, I want you to think about it as I go through it, because we all love to read, we all love to watch movies, and we all go through life together. So listen, first of all, there's a beginning and an end. There's the creation and the consummation. There's a catastrophe which occurs, which is the fall in the bigger story. There's a plan of deliverance. There's salvation and redemption. And within that plan of deliverance, there's conflict and there's journey. These are the characters. Then there's the characters who develop. There's the characters that are set apart. There's characters that heal, that grow, and develop all along through the story. And then there's significance. There's always significance. And anything that we read, anything that we watch, there's always a purpose, right? And there's a purpose in life. There's a purpose for everything. And that purpose for everything is the providence of God. As that little video showed with Laney, uh, Laney was the one, Laney Rollins was the one that wanted to hear that video during the offering. He said that they didn't believe in luck, right? You see, there's a purpose behind everything. There's no such thing as an accident. There's no such thing as chance. There's no such thing as luck. And when you sit there and you watch a movie, when you read a book, you see all of those elements. But not only do you see them when you uh, look at books or watch movies, but you should see it in your life. Because your life is a story. Many times when we read a book or we watch that movie, those five elements come into play. You see, your life is a story because you have a beginning and you have an end. You have a catastrophe or you have catastrophes, amen? I call them potholes. There's a plan of deliverance even in conflict and journey. Thank God for his grace and his mercy. You develop as a character. You should be maturing as you go through life. As you go and you trust Christ in your life, you should be maturing. And you should develop the character of the Son. And there's significance in your life, right? That's where a lot of folks miss out because they're looking for purpose of life. They're looking for significance and they're looking all over the place, but they can't find it in the one who created them and wants a relationship with him. You see, that's the whole story, right? But do you realize in that big story, you're just a, a tweet? Or maybe you're an Instagram. Or maybe you're a Snapchat. Or maybe you're just a snapshot. Or maybe you're a chapter or a sequence in a movie which concerns your life. You ever thought about it that way? That's why I wanted Big Daddy Weave to be able to sing that song. You see, this is my story and this is my song. What's your story this morning? How does it pan out? Do you understand the bigger story that you're in? And do you understand that the story you should be writing as you go through this life? You see, we're going to examine Paul's story and how his story impacted many lives this morning. How his story opened up a learning tool for us to follow so that our stories will impact future generations to come. In Acts 22, we're still... Uh, in Acts, we're going to look at Acts 22. We're going to go through verses 1 through 30 real quickly. 
But we're still in our series, Turning the World Upside Down, and the title of the message is, With Your Story. Do you turn the world upside down with your story? You see, when telling our story, we start with our past. The first truth we need to see is when we tell our story, we start with our past. Now, a lot of people won't tell you to do that. A lot of people say you don't spend time on telling your past. But look what Paul does. Remember Paul? He was up on the steps. This crowd wanted to kill him. He was up on the steps and he said, just wait just one second, please. Can I address the crowd? And we talked about how that was his, his love language. He, he loved the people so much that he wanted to tell them about Jesus Christ. So the first truth I want us to see is we start with our past. Look at verse 1. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense which I now offer to you. And when they heard that, he was addressing them in Hebrew dialect. They become even more quiet. He said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cachilia, who brought up in this city and educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, just as you all are today. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and putting both men and women in prison. As also the high priest and all the councils of the elders can testify, from them I also received letters to the brethren and started off for Damascus in order to bring even those who were th there to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. You see, I want you to notice real quick that Paul talks to them about his past. You see, but he also finds common ground with them. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the Jewish leaders. Yeah, I'm sure there are Gentiles there, but he's talking to the Jewish leaders and he's found some common ground there you see it depends on who we're talking about to our stories and how we approach them we see that with paul you see paul says he builds his defense he he builds his apologia in the greeks what that means what does that word apologia mean it means defense so paul is talking to him and says here here's my defense let me just talk to you a little bit about what's going on. He talked to them in the Hebrew dialect. He's, he's connecting with them in their hearts. He's, he's talking to them about their brothers and fathers. Do you see that? You see, he's respecting people. As he goes in and he talks about his story, he starts his story off and he connects with their heart. He respects them. You see, anytime we're talking to people about our story in Christ, we should respect them and be gentle with them. Just like Paul does. We shouldn't try to stuff it down their throat. We shouldn't try to get angry and mad and, and do everything that we can to jam that story down their throat. We should be respectful to them. And catch them on common ground. We should find that common ground like Paul did. How we used to live our life. What we used to do. Have you ever told anybody who you were before Christ? How you acted? Oh, Chris, I'm not going to do that. My goodness gracious, they wouldn't think, no. You see, Paul didn't mind sharing his past. Why should we? Why should we? It demonstrates to people that we're human like them. You ever think about that? It demonstrates to them, say, hey, you know what? I'm just like you. I'm messed up just like you are. I was messed up. This is how I was messed up. This is what I was chasing in life. You see, Paul touched at the very hearts of his Jewish heritage. He, he talked to them about the motherland, the, the uh, Jerusalem, the holy city. He was educated by the best, the leading professor. He was the expert in the law. Everybody came to Gamaliel. And the Jews understood that, that he was the man that you go to, to talk to about religion. He was the teacher. You see, they couldn't help but relate and say, hey, wait a second, this man, he's got something. 
You see, Paul was zealous for the law. Did you see it? He said, I was zealous for the law just like you were in verse 3. Zealous for God. You see, when we tell our stories, we need to hit the highs and the low points. We need to tell it all. It's got to be all. We need to get and relate with people. The things we've done by our own standards. You see, I try to live my life by my own standards, and it didn't work. I chased after all these things. Or we thought we knew it. That's the legalistic standards. You know what? There's people in church week after week after week who are so legalistic that they're not saved. Oh, they think they are because they keep all the laws. Or they, they try to be as good as they can, but they're not saved. Because they keep the legalistic standpoint. We in our own minds think that we're right on track. Paul did, didn't he? Paul said, hey, you know what? Let me tell you what I've done. This is who I thought I was supposed to be. I was supposed to be checking that off. I was supposed to be taking these rabble rousers, gathering them up and throwing them in prison. But you ask Chris, so how do we do that in our own lives? It's simple. We have to ask ourselves a few questions. What about my life before Christ will relate most to the non-Christians that I know? In, the, in, in your life, the non-Christians that you know, what part of your life would relate to them? You see how Paul brought all that in? What did my life revolve around at that point in time? Before I came to Christ, what was my life all about? What did it entail? What was my focus on? You ever thought about it? Have you ever even thought about your story? Have you ever written it down so that you can talk to somebody else about it? Where did I get my security from? Or where did I get my identity from? Or where did I get my happiness from? That's part of your story. Of how you chased all that. And then understood that's what, where all that came from. How did those things begin to let me down? Maybe you're here this morning and you hadn't even thought about those questions. Today's a good day to think about it. Be a part of that story. Secondly, when telling our story, we, we tell of his grace and transformation in our lives. Look in verse 6. But it happened that day that as I was on my way approaching Damascus about noontime, a very bright light suddenly flashed from heaven all around me, and I fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus the Nazarene, who you are persecuting. And those who were with me saw the light, to be sure, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Get up and go on into Damascus, and there you will be told of all that hath been appointed for you to do. Underline that. But since I could not see because of the brightness of the light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. A certain... Ananias, a man who was devout by the standard of the law and well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there. Do you see that? Once again, he's connecting to their hearts. Came to me, standing near, and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very time, I looked up at him. And he said, The God of our fathers has appointed you, you can underline that, to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear an utterance from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard. Now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized. Wash away your sin, calling on his name. The second truth we have to see when we're telling our story is we tell of his grace and transformation in our life. This is what Christ has shown us. What has Christ shown to you in your life? Have you been faithful to tell others about the story that he has given you? Have you been faithful in telling others about the grace and the transformation in your life? Paul talks about his meeting with Jesus Christ. Now, 
You know what? Paul was stopped in his tracks by Christ. Jesus intervened and got Paul's attention, and Paul heard his voice. Now you say, well, Chris, you know what? Jesus didn't intervene in my life like that. There wasn't a bright light. There wasn't something knocking on my head. So you know what? My testimony's not as exciting as what Paul's is. No, your testimony counts. Your story counts, folks. No matter how or what you think about it, your story counts in the bigger picture of the story that God has for this earth because your story may impact somebody else's life in which they come to understand the grace of Jesus Christ. What did Paul do? Look, he, he asked the question. Look in verse 8. Who are you, Lord? It's all right to ask questions, folks. Who are you, Lord? Who are you, Jesus? Are you really who they say you are? Well, Paul got to see him face to face. We take it by faith. But we have very, a whole bunch of evidence in the Bible that tells us who Jesus is, both outside and inside the Bible. Who are you? It's a question who, who everyone asks who trusts in the Lord. Who are you, Lord? Who are you? You're not going to trust into something unless you understand what it's all about, right? Let me give you an example. Y'all came in here, y'all sang, stood up, sit down, stood up, sit down. Y'all trusted in these pews, didn't you? Why did you trust in the pews? Because you know the evidence behind it. You know that they're solid. You know that there's something to sit on, right? But you've never seen the people that made it. You've never seen the people that installed it. But you trusted it, right? Who are you? You see, Paul's attention was to seek the truth of what's going on. And what did Jesus say? Jesus of Nazarene. The very man that, G uh, that Paul was persecuting was sitting there telling him who he was and what he was all about. And then look what Paul says in verse 10. You see, after you trust in Jesus Christ, this is the next question we have to ask. What shall I do, Lord? See that? What shall I do? The next step is obedience. Okay, Lord, now I know who you are and I've trusted in you. Now, what do I need to do next? What's my next step? You see, you're building your story. You're walking through the story. See how he bent his words towards the ones he was talking about with even Christ. Now, just, just imagine, Paul's story was his, within a story, right? <clears throat> Paul was telling about his conversion, but he was telling them to what? A crowd, to his brothers and sisters. And then there's another story on top of that, which is God's story about his plan of deliverance. It's a story within a story within a story. Paul was talking to them about the righteous one. They knew exactly who that was. They understood the Old Testament scriptures. They knew that the righteous one was the Messiah that was going to come. The standard of the law. That's what they lived their life by. And that's why because they, they missed out on the Messiah. But you say, Chris, how can I, how can I work this way into my story? Well, you have to ask yourself how I trusted Christ. Have you ever asked that uh, so that you could get your story complete? How I trusted Christ. You have to ask the question, when was the first time I heard the gospel and what was my initial reaction? Do you remember when you first heard the gospel and Jesus Christ opened your heart to trust in him? Can you go back to that time? Some people can name the dates. Other people, it's a progress. But do you remember that? And can you tell others about that? You know, I've told a lot of folks when, when I was sitting down and, and talking to them about my story, that I was messed up, that I'd done things that uh, I was ashamed of, that I followed things that, that weren't good, that I let things in my mind that should have never been there, that I saw things with my eyes that I should have never seen. 
But I said, let me tell you something about my Savior in whom I trust in, who forgave me. And I'm not ashamed to say that His grace is upon my life. And He can transform your life as well as He transformed mine. That's what Paul's doing. Paul's taking this hostile crowd and he's relating to them. When and why did my perspective begin to change towards Christ? When was it? When did your perspective start to change? As you grew a little bit? As you, as you understood the evidence that was presented? And then what were the final struggles that went through my mind just before I trusted him? What were those final struggles? Do I? Don't I? Do I? Don't I? Do I? No, I don't. Well, yeah. Oh, you know what? The truth's there. I trust you, Lord. Why did I finally decide to trust Christ? Why are you following Christ? People want to know that. Why are you following him? Because grandma and grandpa did, mom and dad did, my brother did. He's a preacher, you know. Because he's a preacher, I'm going to follow Jesus, but I don't even know who he is. Maybe you're sitting there this morning thinking the same thing. Well, you know what? I really don't know who Jesus is. I don't really have a story to tell up until just that first truth that I'm really in the past, living in the present doing the same thing. When telling our story, we tell of our calling. Yes, we all have a calling. Look in verse 17. It happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I fell into a trance. And I saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. Now that was the Lord. Okay, that was the Lord talking to, to Paul. And Paul said, and I said, Lord, they themselves understand that in one synagogue after another, I used to imprison and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of your witness, Stephen, was being shed, I also was standing by approving and watching out for the coats of those who were slain. He was saying, you know what? I approved of murder, folks. I watched a young man who stood in his story get murdered because of what he believed in. And he said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. You see, this is what Christ has called us to do, folks. He said, no, wait a second now. I'm not like Paul. I'm not supposed to go out to the Gentiles. I'm not supposed to be specifically commissioned as a missionary or a pastor. No, we're all called to go tell our stories. Every one of us in here who knows Jesus Christ should tell their story to somebody else. Because somebody else is in a story in which we get to be a character in. Paul knew his ministry was to go to the Gentiles. He was telling them that. To tell the story to lost people, but he also knew he needed to tell his brothers, the Jews. That's why he always went to the synagogues first. He went to the synagogues. He said, hey, let me tell you about the Messiah. He's the king. They ran him out. He went to the Gentiles. The Gentiles were happy. Why? Because they heard the story of love and grace. That they could be forgiven. He was told specifically by the Lord to go. Do you know that you are told specifically by the Lord to go and to share your story? If you don't, when the opportunity arises, you're disobedient. The only way that you cannot be successful is not to share your story. We have a calling in our lives, just as Paul has a calling here. We have a calling to go and tell our stories. We have a calling to go to our vocations and tell others about Jesus Christ. 
don't think that you do or don't. Wherever you're at, you have a responsibility to tell people your story. People are out there looking, looking, wanting to know, how come your story is so great? Why do you, why don't, there's people that have gone through the same thing that you have gone through who are looking for people who know what has happened in that situation. And they're looking for somebody to come and say, let me tell you my story. You know what? I went through that same thing. I went through babies. I went through uh, moms or dads or having a hard time parenting or whatever it is. Let me tell you my story. You see, I trusted Jesus Christ. And when I trusted him, he told me that I could always go to him. That he would never leave me nor forsake me. That he would give me the wisdom and the knowledge if I asked and I sought out his truth. Let me tell you how we got through this pothole, through this cancer, through this sickness, through this death, through this. You get it? People are looking for that out in the world. How do you do that? <laughs> it's because my life's been transformed by Jesus Christ. There's other folks. whose story is going on, who's looking for an ending, who's looking for a way to understand the bigger story. You see, it's not to be put on a bookshelf. Ah, you know what? I trusted Christ. That's one thing I'm going to do in my life. Put it up on the bookshelf. Is that what you do with a good book? Good movie? Or do you tell others about it? Hey, you need to read this book. You need to watch this movie. Why don't we do it with our life? It's not to be put on a list and checked off. Okay, before Christ, yep. You know what? My past was awful. I trusted Christ. Yep, okay. I've done what I need to do. After Christ, no, nah, I'm not going to check that off. I'm just going to set it up there on the bookshelf. You see, life after Christ is supposed to be told in wonderful stories to others. How my life is different. L list specific changes in your attitude and perspective while you're talking to them. Look, this is the way I used to think. This is the way I think now because of him. This is what I lived for back then. This is what I live for now. This is what motivates me. Jesus Christ motivates me. Does he motivate you? I hope so. I hope he motivates you. Because when he motivates you, you get peace. You get understanding. You get opportunities to share your story. He'll take you right along, and he'll write your story. Even though my life isn't perfect, how does knowing Christ help me with this fact? You know what? I know I'm a sinner. Chris, you're a sinner. Man, you get up there and preach every Sunday. Why? You know what? I don't put something on that makes me more holy than you are. I'm journeying through this life just like you all are. This is the way I was. But you know what? When that old man comes up, that anger, that bitterness, whatever it is, I can call on the author of my story, and he pushes it back down because I remember the grace that he's given us. Folks, that's authentic Christianity. That's authentic Christianity. When we share our stories with others, telling them about our mistakes and forgiveness, then we share our weaknesses. And guys, we don't like to share our weaknesses because we're too prideful. There's too much testosterone going on. And no, they're not going to know that I have a weakness in me. That's not the way you're made. It's not the way you're made either, women. People want to know stories. They want to know ours. Push it down. 
and share with them and see what God can do. We show authenticity. We show genuineness, originality, validity. You see, that validifies who we are in Christ because people see that. We're not just talking. They see the action. They understand who we are. We're, not, we're walking the walk and we're talking the talk. Faith has to have feet. Faith has to have action. If they don't see the action in your life, it's just like voices in their head, just mumbling. And then when you, you come to them and you say, hey, you know what? I'm sorry, I messed up. Forgive me, but let me tell you what it's all about. Let me tell you the story. But we'll still, folks, no matter how much we share it, no matter how we love people, no matter what happens in our life, we'll still get persecuted for telling the story. When telling our story, we're ready to be persecuted for our stance. Look in verse 22. They listened to him up to this statement, and then they raised their voices and they said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. Kill him. How dare he bring the Gentiles into this? You know, we hate the Gentiles. We don't want the gospel to go over to the Gentiles. We don't want that person in church. Look at them. Look, they're different from us. How dare they want to come in and be a part of this church by today's standards? That's pretty good. And as they were crying out and throwing off their cloaks and tossing dust in the air. I want, did you get that picture? The tossing dust. You ever watch PBS and Nature? You ever watch the monkeys get real agitated on PBS? You know what the first thing they do do is? They get down, they start with the dusts. They start throwing things. And they get so worked up, get so worked up that it's nothing but a frenzy. You ever watch that? I've seen it several different times when they're studying That's how much of a frenzy that that is. And I can tell you, folks, that when you share your story, that there's going to be people like that. There's going to be groups like that. You're going to see it. I've seen it. I've had people this far from my faith threatening me. The commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks, stating that he should be examined. What does that mean? By scourging. So that, they, that he might find out the reason why they were shouting against him. But when they stretched him out with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by him, it, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? See, that could get the commander killed. Paul was a Roman citizen. When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and told him, saying, What are you about to do for this man's Roman? The commander came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman? And Paul said, Yes. The commander answered, I acquired this citizenship with a large sum of money. You could buy it. And Paul said, Ah, but I was actually born a citizen. God delivered him from that situation. Therefore, those who were about to examine him immediately let go of him, and the commander also was afraid when he found out that he was a Roman and because he had put him in chains. But on the next day, wishing to know for certain why he had been accused by the Jews, he released him and ordered the chief priests and all the council to assemble and brought Paul down and set them before him. You know what? We are ready to be persecuted for our stand. Paul still was going to be persecuted by the soldiers, not only by the crowd, but the soldiers. Yet in his story, I want you to see that he used some common sense. You see, Paul knew that that beating, that scourging that he was going to get could either kill him or it served no purpose. So God gave him the wisdom and the knowledge of understanding that, you know what, I can get out of this. 
I'm a Roman citizen, guys, and if you do that to a Roman citizen, then you guys can be put to death. <laughs> see, there's common sense in that. You see, it, it, allowed, it, it allowed him unnecessary pain and heartache. Folks, when we tell our story and when people get all huffy with us or, or whatever it may be, we need to use common sense in our story. Where to stop? Where to stop it? Where we're at. Not being overpowering. Just using wisdom and knowledge in how to approach that situation and our surroundings. How far to go with our story. You know what? Sometimes when you're talking to people about your story, you don't have to go all the way to the gospel end. Sometimes you're just planting a seed. Nikki Waldeck was a freshman at the University of Michigan. She played women's soccer, and by her own admittance, her life was rudderless. She was drinking. She was going with the flow. She was rolling along with the crowd, just living life as usual. Had no standard. Yet in her sophomore year, she went to a meeting of athletes in action. That was part of Campus Crusade for Christ's ministry. They call it crew now. It's an outreach to college and athletes. She trusted in and embraced, embraced Christ at one of these meetings. Her life was transformed, and she understood the grace of God, and she understood that grace that was shown to her. She's now a part of the leadership team there, but she felt guilty because of not making much of an impact. Are you there? You know what I'm talking about? You see, Paul made an impact anywhere he wanted to go. But let me ask you this question. Do you make an impact of telling people about the story? You see, she, she felt guilty about that. She, she knew that she needed to do more than what she was doing. She knew she needed to reach out to a teammate, Whitney, who was her roommate. She could see a lot of Whitney in herself. You know somebody like that? And, and she wanted Whitney to know the love of Christ. So driving with Whitney to the pharmacy one evening, Whitney told Nikki she needed to talk with her right then and there. They pulled into a coffee shop. As Nikki listened to Whitney's story, she told her about her own story. See, she didn't go down with the line of evidence. She didn't go down there with the apologetic sins of it. She didn't go there with the scientific evidence. She told her her own story. How she had been living life without a purpose, a rudder. But when she trusted Jesus, he had changed her life. Later that night, Whitney texted Nikki to please come downstairs where she was located. Nikki went downstairs and Whitney wanted to trust in Jesus Christ. And Nikki did the best she could, the best she knew how, to tell her how to trust in Jesus Christ. It was Nikki who chose to be involved in the bigger story, God's story, of building his kingdom. Nikki's story is within the realms of God's bigger story. Jeremy Taylor said, God is the master of scenes. We must not choose what part we act shall act out. It concerns us only to be careful that we do it well, always saying, if this Please, God, let it be as it is. Do you choose that? Do you choose to be part of the bigger story with your story so you can impact somebody else's story? Do you share your story? Are you prepared to tell others your story? Or do you say, eh, that's not for me. I'm not going to be a part of that. Really? We share our stories all the time. Don't we? How you doing? Oh, well, you know what? My leg hurts. My bursitis hurts. Oh, well, I've got this, that. We share our stories all the time, don't we? But we always leave out the most important part of the story, and that's how Jesus Christ transformed our life. You see, the solution to the problem is the main plot, right? And the answer to that 
problem is Jesus Christ. Where are you at in your story this morning? Have you been introduced to Jesus Christ in the story of the sacred romance? You're in a sacred romance, folks. Whether you know it or not, that's God's story. You're in a sacred romance. You're never alone. Even when you're single, you're never alone. God knows your story. He knows what's going on. Maybe you don't understand that. Maybe he's knocking on your door or your heart today. Maybe he's speaking to you and saying, hey, you know what? You need to part, be a part of my story this morning. Do you know him? Have you trusted him? Do you know what he did on the cross of Calvary? That he died, was buried, and raised again? That's the story. Have you trusted in that this morning? You see, God's still writing your story. But do you want to develop it? Do you want to develop in that story? Christian, do you tell your story? Can you tell your story? Let me ask you that. Can you tell your story? You can tell your story of growing up, having kids, grandchildren, but can you tell the story of the most important part of your life in trusting Jesus Christ, knowing your purpose, who you are, and where you're going? Do you know that part? Whatever it is he's speaking to you right now, you do it. If that's coming down here to the altar to speak to him, you do it. If it's... Uh, speaking to him right where you're at in your seat, you do it. If it's speaking to me, you come and you do it. If he's telling you to come and trust him and you need somebody to talk to, you come and you trust him and you talk to me 